Good afternoon and welcome to Armenian Christian Fellowship. We're so glad you joined us here today amidst what's happening with the coronavirus. I know we're all in our separate homes and yet together we gather to worship the Lord. You know, 2,000 years ago, people gathered together to welcome Christ, and there was no fear of a virus. Well, every day we hear about these numbers. This many people have it, that many people have been hospitalized, so many people are on ventilators. And it's sad and heartbreaking to hear, and it could be overwhelming. But today, I'd like us to focus on some other numbers. We worship a triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And they're with us here together right now. And Jesus is the one who died for us and gave us eternal life. Yes, daily we hear about the virus spreading, and I know we're all doing our part. But today, let's put that aside. Enough about the spreading of the virus. Let's spread God's word with some joy and strength and love as we gather together and worship in our homes, separate but not alone, distant but not feeling apart, absent from the physical hugs, but present with the embrace of the Spirit. While there may be social distancing and physical distancing, we know the scripture says nothing can separate us from the love of God. And today we come to you in God's spirit of love and in prayer as we endure this hardship together. Let us be reminded of the words of Paul from 1 Thessalonians 2, 17 through 20. Paul longed to see his brothers and sisters again, and he said, But since we were torn away from you, brothers and sisters, for a short time, in person, but not in heart. We endeavored the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face because we wanted to come to you. I, Paul, again and again wanted to come, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming? Is it not you? For you are our glory and our joy. Paul had a sense of great longing and anticipation and hope to one day see his brothers and sisters again. And today we gather with you in that same spirit of longing and anticipation and hope that we will one day, once again, be together at church, gathered in the fellowship in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Until then, join with me and Wendy and Jen as we bring to you the worship music. Sing, sing together with your families, raise your voices in praise and worship to our living God who gives us hope and peace and life through his son, Jesus Christ. The first song we'll be singing together is All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name.
Yeh mi anah bini mi asna far yeh peng hi ba Azan iska tek za far elu yeh tek pa pa ki Yeh mi anah mek tsai no mek ho ho para pa nek May the Lord bless you as we continue the rest of our service. Let's sing Hosanna together.
Palm Sunday Church. Um, at this time, I'd like to read Psalm 118, verses 25 through 29. Psalm 118, verses 25 through 29. The psalmist says, Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has made his light to shine upon us. Bind the festal sacrifice with cords up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, and I will extol you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Yes, even in this time, our Lord's steadfast love endures. He is a good God, and don't forget that, church. What a promise we have from our Lord. What a good Father we have. Church, at this time, I'd just like to uh, mention a few things, some of the... Um, uh, family life and the community life that we have going on in our church. We would love for you to get plugged in. And we have Zoom prayer rooms um, ready for you this next week on Tuesdays and Thursdays and Tuesday mornings at 8 a.m. We'll be coming together through Zoom to pray. Um, and Thursdays at 5 p.m. Really, uh, this is such a blessed time, such an amazing time. We did that all last week, and we're able to pray for one another, pray for the sick, pray for the weak. We'd love for you to just use this time to be in prayer, church. Pray for our world, pray for our church, pray for everyone. And um, yeah, just meet with us, and your pastors will be ready to pray with you through that. All right, this next week, Holy Week that's coming up, we have our college and career group hosted by Pastor Shant and Jen on Tuesday nights at 7 p.m. That's our college and career group. Our Armenian Bible studies hosted by Pastor Aaron are, will be held on Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. And that's Wednesday nights at 7 uh, through Zoom as well. All these things will be through Zoom. And our Holy Week services will give you more information coming up. We'll email you that through our church weekly email for Monday, Thursday on Thursday night and Good Friday on Friday night. Uh, and this part of our service would ask for you to um, continue your offering and your worship. And we'd love for you to give, continue giving on through PushPay. And you can still send checks to our church office. Uh, if you'd like to give through PushPay, you can text ACFOC to 77977. Once again, you could give through PushPay, which is uh, texting ACFOC to 77977. Also, just want to make this clear and just want to continue on, on asking you guys to do this. If you need anything, uh, one of our pastors will be on standby all week. Just call the office. Um, if you like prayer, please contact our office and we'll, one of our pastors will be ready to pray with you and be with you in this time. Uh, church, would you pray with me now? Uh, Lord, we are thankful for what you have done on the original Palm Sunday. Lord God, how you entered into one of your um, hardest weeks to sacrificially give your life for us. Father, as you entered into Jerusalem, many people were screaming and shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna. Father, they laid palm branches at your feet, but that's as far as their worship and extent of their love for you went. Father God, when you entered into Jerusalem, no one crowned you with a crown. Oh Christ, no one gave you a kingdom. No one bowed to you. But Father, um, this Palm Sunday, we crown you the king of our lives. We ask that you would be the king of, of your church, as you already are. Father, we praise you. We thank you for what you've done. And this Palm Sunday, we celebrate that. We remember that as Holy Week is upon us. We thank you for the sacrifice and the love that you've given us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Happy Palm Sunday, everyone. Hosanna to God in the highest. That we can't be together today, we can study God's word. And I'm so excited to just talk about Palm Sunday with you all this morning. Today we're going to be reading from Matthew 21. So you can just turn there if you want just to get started. But this is how the story of Palm Sunday goes. 2,000 years ago, at that time, Jesus' popularity was at an all-time high, and for good reason. Over the last few days, Jesus had not only healed two blind people in a nearby village, he had also raised Lazarus from the dead. And so as you read the New Testament in Matthew, right up to that chapter in um, 
uh, in the book of Matthew, chapter 21, what you start to see is that Jesus's popularity is expanding. In fact, he is becoming quite a celebrity and the crowds that were gathering around him were increasing day by day. And so as Jesus and his disciples neared the city of Jerusalem to celebrate Passover 2,000 years ago, rather than walking in as they normally would, Jesus told his disciples to go ahead of him to a village to pick up a donkey. And that's how the story of Palm Sunday begins. So just look at it with me, if you will, in your Bible in Matthew 21. This is what we read. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go into the village in front of you and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to you. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say the Lord needs them and he will give them to you at once. Jump down to verse six. We read this, the disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks and he sat on them. And so as far as we can tell here, Jesus had pre-arranged a rental for his arrival into Jerusalem. And as odd as that may have seemed, even to the disciples during that time, the disciples trusted Jesus completely. And what we learn is that as soon as they go into the village, sure enough, they find a donkey and a colt. They would look to the owner. They say to the owner, the secret word, the Lord needs them. The owner knows what they are talking about. He gives them the donkey and the colt. They have the animals in no time, and the setting for Palm Sunday had begun. What happens next now may be familiar to many of us, but today as we read the Palm Sunday, Palm Story narrative, I want us to ask ourselves a question that we may have never considered before. And that question is, why did Jesus find it necessary to ride into Jerusalem on a donkey that Palm Sunday. Now this may seem like an insignificant question at first, but did you know that coming into Jerusalem on Passover week on an animal was a big no-no? It would be like driving a car through Disneyland without permission on a crowded day. Or it would be as irreverent as driving a car down an April 24th parade. It was just a big no-no, something that you weren't supposed to do, culturally speaking. And so when Jesus pre-arranged a ride in Jerusalem, he was doing that to make a statement to the crowd that was quickly gathering around him. But what statement was Jesus trying to make? And why did Jesus pick a donkey in the first place? Why not a horse? Why not a chariot? Why not something with a little more glamour? Why did Jesus pick a Toyota to make a statement or to cause a ruckus when he could have picked a Rolls Royce? That's the question I want us to ask today. And as we look closely at our reading today for this morning, I want to show you that Jesus intentionally chose the donkey and not a stallion during this week in Jerusalem to teach those who were willing to pay attention to very important things. One, about who he was, and two, about what he came to do. Jesus chose a donkey to teach people who he was and what he came to do. So let's get started. I want to show you what those things were. The first reason why Jesus chose to ride into Jerusalem on a donkey during Passover, even though it was a major faux pas, was to reveal to his people that he was the Messiah. And he did this by fulfilling two Old Testament prophecies at the time. 
Matthew paraphrases those prophecies. They come from the book of Isaiah and Zechariah. Let's read those together, starting in verse 4. This is what we read. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal, the beast of burden. And so right here we see very clearly why Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey that day. Jesus rode into Jerusalem because he had told his people down through the centuries that the Messiah King, the Savior of the world, would come into Jerusalem not on a chariot, but by a donkey. In other words, the donkey was to be the calling card of the Messiah. Jesus chose a donkey and not a horse to tell everyone, look, I am the Messiah. I am your promised king. Jesus's actions there in picking that donkey were very intentional. They were planned. You see, for most of Jesus' ministry, Jesus had been coy about his identity, but this was his grand reveal. And as we keep reading, we see that the crowds understood what Jesus was doing when he picked that donkey that day, and they actually believed him. To see this, let's keep reading, starting in verse 8. This is what we read. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road and others cut branches from the tree and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. It's obvious here, is it not, that everyone understood what Jesus was doing because as soon as Jesus saddled that donkey, as soon as he started to approach Jerusalem, everyone's bursting into celebration. In fact, they not only honored Jesus with a red carpet of cloaks and ferns that they put on the road, but they also celebrated Jesus by singing a song taken straight out of Psalm 118 that celebrated the song coming of the Messiah. The psalm in verse uh, in Psalm 118, 25 through 26 says this: Lord save us. In the Hebrew, Lord save us is Hosanna. Lord grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord we bless you. You see, down through the ages, God's people would sing songs of prayer from this very psalm during times of celebration as they looked forward to their day of salvation. However, on that day, on that Palm Sunday, because Jesus rode into town on a donkey, they were no longer singing that song. They were no longer praying that psalm, asking God to bring them a savior. They were praying that song and using that song to thank God for bringing them that savior. Hosanna meant praise God or God save us. And son of David was just another way of referring to the Messiah. And so as they sang Hosanna to the son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest, they were celebrating that Jesus was in fact their savior, their Messiah. They understood the calling card of the donkey. They understood that Jesus walked into Jerusalem that day to identify himself as their king, as their savior. But there was another reason that Jesus chose to ride into Jerusalem on a donkey during Passover, even when he could have chosen a stallion. And it had to do with the sort of savior Jesus would be. You see, Jesus wanted the people to know that, at least for the now, that he was coming to bring mercy, not judgment. Peace, not war. The donkey, in light of the prophecy, was intended to communicate to the people 
that their savior was in town. They got that part. But notice what the prophecy says. This is what we read in the prophecy. It says, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey. The key word here is gentle. Now, I don't know about you. I don't know if you have ridden on a donkey before, but I have. Uh, when Jen and I went to Bryce National Park several years back, we decided to go on a horseback ride or a horseback uh, um, tour through Bryce National Park so we could see parts of the park that we had never seen before. But unfortunately, when we went to the stable, after the stable hand took one look at me, he decided that he would give Jen a horse and me a donkey. Now, needless to say, I, I really was not happy about this. It made me feel like, I mean, look, man, why are you giving me a donkey? But when it came down to it, the reason I got the donkey and she got the horse was because Jen knew what she was doing and I, I did it. I was just, wait. You see, donkeys are calm, peaceful, predictable creatures that don't do much well, other than carrying heavy things around for very long times in a very, very peaceful, predictable manner. But horses, well, horses are wild creatures. They can trot, they can gallop, they can maneuver, they can go to war. Horses have a beauty, horses have a majesty, they have an honor, they have a fierceness. They have all these qualities that donkeys just do not have. And because of this, most of the time, kings would ride around from city to city and um, through the countryside on horses, not donkeys. But sometimes, just sometimes, a king would choose to ride into town on a donkey to show everyone that they were in a time of peace. Sometimes a king would choose to ride into town on a donkey to celebrate the fact that they were at peace. And so when Jesus rode in on a donkey that day, he was being very, very intentional. He wasn't just wanting to communicate to people that he was their king, that he was their Messiah, but he wanted to communicate to people that he was their Messiah, their savior, and he was their Messiah and savior who would save them through humility. He wasn't the kind of Messiah they were expecting. Jesus was trying to communicate to those who were willing to pay close enough attention that he was coming not to judge, but to be judged. He wasn't coming with a show of militaristic power, but he was coming with a show of supernatural peace. In fact, just a few verses before this Palm Sunday event, as Jesus was walking with his disciples into Jerusalem, he looked at them and said, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus was doing his very, very best to make it clear to his disciples and to everyone who was willing to listen that he wasn't coming to be a militaristic leader. He was coming to serve. He was coming to die. In fact, a few verses even before that, we read this. As his disciples are walking along, as they're walking into Jerusalem, he looks at them and says, we're going to Jerusalem and the son of man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They'll condemn him to death. They'll hand him over to Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. On the third day, he will be raised to life. Jesus knew that he came to suffer and die. That's why. He chose to come into town on a donkey. But unfortunately, that was too tough of a pill for many people to swallow. 
The Jews were so overcome by their national trials that they could not see or understand what Jesus was doing right in front of them. They were so overwhelmed and obsessed with the challenges that they had as a nation that they cherry-picked over the Old Testament prophecies to have them mean exactly what they wanted them to mean. They wanted a Savior, but they wanted a Savior that would save them from their from their Roman fo foes. They wanted a savior that would make them physically comfortable rather than a savior that would make them eternally safe. And consequently, they completely missed the beauty of what their king had in store for them that day. To see that, let's keep reading starting in verse 10. This is what we read. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? The crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Now this is a sobering ending to a powerful passage because as soon as Jesus enters in Jerusalem, we read that the city was stirred. Now that word stirred there could perhaps better be translated disturbed or shaken People were troubled by Jesus. And people not only miss the full meaning of the donkey, but in verse 11, depending on how you read it, it even seems that no sooner had Jesus marched into the city of Jerusalem proper that they had forgotten that Jesus was even their king at all. You see, Jesus intentionally chose to come to Jerusalem that day on a donkey to communicate to everyone that he was their humble savior, their gentle king. But because of their pride, because of their preconceived notions, because of their unwillingness to open their eyes and simply pay attention to what was going on around them, they completely missed God's loving intentions for them. And in a week, they had him crucified. And so my encouragement to you all this morning is twofold. Number one, remember that Jesus is always in control and is always intentional in everything he does. In other words, there is no detail in your life that is not overseen by God, even the coronavirus. Even in these unsure times, even when your health, your money, your friends, your family, and even when life itself is on a razor's edge, Jesus reigns as your gentle king. Just as he used the storm in the weeks prior to teach his disciples something sweet about himself, and just as he used a simple donkey to teach those who were willing to, um, to listen something magnificent about his intentions for him, um, for his people. God uses all things, even the coronavirus, to draw his people closer to himself and to bring them good things. In fact, the apostle Paul says this beautiful verse that many of us have memorized. In Romans, he says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those him of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. Jesus has an intention in everything that is going on in your life. He intends to bring you peace. He intends to bring you good. Keep that in mind as you're struggling right now. However, there is a second encouragement that I have for you, and this is, and it is this. In order to see the good that Jesus has for you and in order to experience it, you have to slow down enough and humble yourself enough to follow Jesus and pay attention to what Jesus is doing. You have to slow down enough to learn the sweetness of what Jesus has to bring you in this storm. You have to slow down enough, even in the chaos that is going around you, to notice that donkey in your life and why it is there. Jesus is your gentle savior, but in order to experience the gentleness and sweetness of God, you have to pay attention and you have to humble yourself to follow Jesus. And so my encouragement to you today 
is that if you are a follower of Jesus, pay attention to what he is doing and be blessed. And if you are not, humble yourself, slow down, turn around from what you are doing, trust Jesus and follow him. And if you do, you will be saved. You will enjoy the sweetness of what he has for you. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, I thank you so much for your kindness, for your goodness in our life. Jesus, I thank you that you are a gentle savior. I thank you that you are intentional in everything that happens in our life, in the storm and even when you bring a weird donkey into our life, Lord, you're using that as well to teach us something sweet about you. Lord, I pray that we would be humble enough to see what you are doing, that we would slow ourselves down enough and calm ourselves enough to pay attention to your word in the world around us and that you would teach us and grow us and draw us ever closer to you. And I pray these things in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. On the other side of, uh, of this Palm Sunday story, we, uh, we have the distinct advantage of seeing the whole picture and seeing what Jesus has done and what his goal was. And so I just want to spend some time just thanking him and praising him for that and for all he's done. Um, let's sing together.
Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we will bless you. The Lord bless and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. We pray these things in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.